Okay, welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today's video is going to be an interesting one. I think you definitely want to stick around to watch this because as I mentioned in yesterday's video, what I've done is I've gone through hours of footage from the WEF meeting at Davos this year. I've taken one particular segment and I've broken it down and taken these small clips of some of the comments that these people have said in order to then show you that here is the evidence for what I've been talking about over the last couple of years. It is in black and white. You see them saying it with their own lips. Okay, so without further delay, let's get straight into it. So a welcome, uh, hardy survivors of last night's parties and people who have not yet left. Two observations there. Number one, Mark Carney is not even wearing shoes for this meeting. Right? This is the guy that's in control of pretty much the world finance, uh, Mark Carney, G-Fans. He's not even wearing shoes to this, uh, to this event, which is, which is somewhat baffling. But second point, this is Martin Wolf, I believe, from the, from the um, FT. And that's probably not how I would open a meeting like this that I know is gonna be all over the world, uh, world leaders and people all over the world seeing this to talk about last night's party and how some people might still be at the party. A very strange opening. How we finance net zero, uh, moving from commitment to action. None of this will happen if people don't put money into it, public and above all, clearly private money. Okay, so next point then, he's talking about the truth of what I've been saying, the net zero they need a lot of money in order to do it. So what they're talking about, they're talking about private money, but also the big institutions, as you'll see as we go through. It will need 50 trillion in incremental investment by 2050, which will have to be invested to get a return for investors. And the sorts of institutions represented here will play a central role in uh, bringing this about. 50 trillion dollars. That is a huge amount of money, $50 trillion. And he's saying as well, the people on that stage, the people in that room are the ones that are going to bring this about. Make no mistake about that. I'm gonna start with you, Mark, since you represent the United Nations, the world. So how far are we? Okay, so we've got to pause on that one. Since you represent the United Nations, the world. Okay, so Mark Carney, they're talking about here. What I've been talking about, He's just said it right there. He represents the world. And what did Mark Carney say? Yeah. He said, yeah. Go along in fixing this. 90% of global emissions are under some form of net zero commitment by countries. 90%. 90% now are under these net zero commitments by countries. 90%. Just think about that for a moment. We need net zero alignment. And it's not just the banking system, it's the entire financial system. Okay, next thing, what did he say there? It's not just the banking system. We've talked about this a lot. He's saying it's the entire financial system. That means you and me as well, by the way. That means our personal, everything we do, our bank accounts, our investments, everything. It includes all of us, the entire financial system. And this is where I believe carbon uh, credits or some sort of some sort of quotas around carbon we don't quite know yet but that's what i think it's going to be some sort of a carbon tax that is going to come in and again i've talked about this a lot the carbon tax will attack those sectors and industries that i talked about seven eight months ago now that we've seen the biggest shrinkage and the biggest inflation in those industries and this is why i, I made that joke a while back that i said if you enjoy your vacations and holidays, take those long distance flights now because you might not be able to take those long distance flights in the future. We need uh, an energy transformation on the scale of the industrial revolution at the speed of the digital transformation. And therefore we need a revolution in finance. Okay, just think about that for a moment. On the scale of the industrial revolution, do you realize how big that was? For the world at that time. This is what he's comparing it to. And the speed of the digital revolution. That, the digital revolution, you've never seen such, 
speed because of the incremental improvements in terms of how digital can improve upon itself. So anyone that thinks this is going to be very, very slow and you know all these things are going to take time. No, he's saying it right there. This is going to be fast and impactful. And then we do need a new um, uh, international uh, uh, financial system, and Makhtar can speak to that in terms of roles of blended finance, roles of carbon markets, carbon credit markets, offset markets. Okay, I, I was ahead of myself there. So he's even talking about these carbon markets. The GFANS, uh, 130 trillion of balance sheet committed to that net zero alignment. Okay, so much to unpack there, but firstly, GFANS, that was at Glasgow. That was that big alliance that they unveiled at Glasgow. Mark Carney is, is head of that, basically. So $130 trillion. That's how much money they've got behind them now, pushing this agenda or initiative, whatever you want to call it. $130 trillion. A 50% reduction of the emissions of their clients, so their portfolio, what they've invested in or lent to, uh, by 2030. The other thing he mentioned there was a 50% reduction in carbon or emissions, it's the same thing, across the GFAN, so across all of those financial institutions and banks that they have lent money or, or they control money in some way. Because remember, you are creditors to the financial institutions. So this is what he's talking about. Those GFAN's members, which are mainly banks and financial institutions, putting practices or policies in place to, for all those people below them to reduce those emissions by 50% by the year 2030. And this is why we keep hearing the year 2030 over and over again. But also bringing it forward from that, five-year decarbonization plans that need to be rolled out and annual reporting. Five-year plans that need to be rolled out and annual reporting. Can you see how strict all of this criteria is. I don't think there's any doubt in my mind or many of their mind that they are going to achieve what they're talking about here. Um, I, I just don't see how it's not going to happen with the speed, the commitment and the amount of money that is behind this initiative. What the institutions are doing is uh, working through and developing those decarbonization plans and it won't surprise you that that means engaging with the people they invest in uh, or lend to for their own plans. Again, he just said it right there and then. Those institutions are going to be putting pressure on, on the institutions below them that they manage and look after to create their own plans. So the way they've done it is very clever. They've gone for the top stakeholders first, those with the biggest sort of spread across the financial uh, industries globally. And they've started with those and they're getting those to put pressure below them, those to put pressure below them. It is just like this whole pyramid model all over again, they're, they're applying the same model that they've applied to other sectors. Coming out um, in uh, the middle of June, very detailed guidance for what is good, what is best practice for financial institution net zero plans. So that is in just two weeks time that this next uh, stage of the, the plan here towards carbon net zero will be coming out the middle of June. What we expect from uh, private companies uh, for their plans. Last point I'll make uh, by way of introduction is this is about real world decarbonization, not the false comfort of portfolio decarbonization. <laughs> you heard it there from the horse's mouth. Okay, so two things. Number one, they're going to put pressure on private companies for their decarbonization plans. But number two, he said, this isn't, you know, like what he's explaining there is this isn't just like offsetting, you know, how some of these companies do carbon offsetting, but it hasn't made any difference in carbon emissions. He's saying right there that they are going to create decarbonization. That is it. So again, we come back to this same question. How do you bring about real world decarbonization? Drop a comment below. I would love to know your thoughts on that. What is most of the carbon on the planet? Where does it all come from? Thank you very much. Um, that certainly sets out a big agenda um, to um, discuss. So how does... <laughs> I don't think he knows what to say to that. I think I'd be in the same position if I'd have just sat through you know, opening remarks and they were the opening remarks I think I would be just as shocked as he is right now. Gosh, imagine that, you're an outsider to all of this and you get hit with that.
uh, in the opening remarks. A bank like ours sets a net zero by 2050 commitment. The other thing we also do is have a shorter term 2030 commitment around our financed emissions. That's the emissions <coughs> that come from our portfolio of, of customers. These aren't just targets that we kind of think about in 2030. The work starts today. Again, we just heard it there. The work starts today, although they're 2030 targets or some of them 2050 targets, the work starts today. So they will put pressure on their bank customers as well. Is there's this whole new thing of a client transition plan, a whole new ask. So this year we published in February our targets for oil and gas and power and utility sectors, the most carbon intensive. Okay, you just heard it there. Oil and gas, power and utilities. What have we been talking about here on the channel? Where have some of the biggest challenges come from? Oil and gas, power and utilities. Oil and gas, this is where we're seeing these exploding prices. Why? Because people like these people here on stage are stopping the investment via the ESG mandates, environmental social governance mandates, into those industries. This is why prices are exploding and we're running out of energy that is available through the current means of extraction. We've got another seven to come next year. Okay, so again, they're focusing on the most carbon intensive first. They've got another seven to come next year. I wonder what those sectors will be. But straight away when we publish those, we have an ask out now to our largest clients in those sectors, over hundreds, to say, we need your transition plan by the end of the year. Again, this is the, the difficulty that you're in because if the bank says to you and they're making all these rules and the laws because the you know the money is in control of everything in, on this planet and they're saying to you we need your carbon transition plans by the end of the year well what happens if you don't provide those plans you might lose your your finance or your credit lines or your bank you know and you say well i'll go elsewhere well, what if you can't go elsewhere what if all the banks which it sounds like now are doing this that means that if you don't invest into what they want you to invest into and get rid of the things that they want you to get rid of, you could be stuck. How do you do business if you don't have a bank account? It's the, the top line issue is that we're not doing enough of it yet, anywhere near enough. No one is, right? If you think about we've got a 40% increase in energy demand by the end of this decade. Okay, I want you to pay really attention to what she's just said there, two things. Number one, we're not doing enough right now. Really? So number so that means it's going to get worse, what we're seeing right now with all the energy problems. It's going to get worse. Number two, I want you to listen to this because you'll hear a contradiction very, very shortly. So she's just said we're going to see a 40% energy increase demand by the end of the decade. Now, you'll understand why in a moment. The amount we need to decline in coal in the energy mix. And now we've got the energy crisis on top. It was already a very unstable transition that we were in at the moment. We need whatever we can do to accelerate capital. Okay, so she's talking about coal here, getting rid of the coal, even though coal is used still in a lot of power plants. And um, why are we having problems? Well, what did the UK do? It destroyed a lot of its power plants, decommissioning other power plants. Now they are talking about extending the life of a couple of them, but we'll see if that actually happens. What is your strategy to adjust your business model if you're in oil and gas to a, a future where you actually have, you know, no longer growth in oil demand, but decline, term, you know, a decline in oil demand over the decades to come? Now, this is what I mean by there's a contradiction there. So, and I think she felt uncomfortable saying that. You could see she was really just looking down the whole time she was, she was saying that. She just said there will be an increase in demand over the decade for energy, 40% increase. But then she's saying there's gonna be this big decrease in demand for oil and gas. Well, how does that make any sense? Why would there be this big decrease in demand for oil and gas, but an increase in energy? Coal phase out policy that we had launched uh, at the end of last year. So there we go. Now you see why some of the issues have been coming in with coal and certain country that produces huge amounts of coal no longer uh, being able to export a lot of that coal. Now just notice that certain military conflicts didn't start when some of these policies were already being put in place. The military conflict started afterwards uh, but of course, no one is even picking up on this or noticing any of these things. And when I say no one, I mean the general public. 
this year we're working, we're going to be working very hard on how, how do we update oil and gas? How do we think about the IEA's recommendations around no new oil and gas reserves? Okay, did you just hear that right there? The IEA's recommendation for no new oil and gas reserves. How do we think about methane given the Glasgow Climate Pact and the important role of methane? Okay, now this is a really, uh, this is what makes me laugh and all the contradictions. You see, when it's people like me that watch these videos from, oh, because they think of it in terms of, oh, I said that a year ago, two years ago, no one's going to go back and watch that video. I do. I'm, I'm that guy. I go back and watch a video from a year or two years ago and they think, oh, well, no one's going to even think about that. Well, guess what? If you remember a year or two ago, they said about methane, oh, we need to get rid of all the methane. And then they said afterwards via a you know, a, a PR thing. Oh no, it was a, they meant to say carbon. They didn't mean to say methane. Didn't mean to say we need to reduce all the methane, um, by, which we know what that is. It's cattle and animals and, and everything else. But now she's just said, in fact, let me play that again. How do we think about methane given the Glasgow Climate Pact and the important role of methane? We're gonna be- So that was their focus at the Glasgow meeting to reduce methane amongst other things. So she's just undone some of the PR work there, I think. Our goal has to be a net zero global economy. And that means we have to be involved in the, the transition finance of the heavy industry in Asia, of the energy sector. In now, a point to note as well here is every single one of these people on this panel are bankers. They are all financiers, every single one of them the transformation the world has to go through. And by that, I mean a significant change in how capital is allocated. Well, we know what that means. It means some sort of carbon-based uh, system. We've made big changes and a lot of progress in the last couple of years, uh, but a lot more to do with a focus on the particularly high emitting sectors, uh, aviation, steel, oil and gas. You keep hearing it over and over again, aviation, oil, steel and gas. And now you understand my sort of half tongue in cheek comment about aviation. And if you want to take that long distance flight, now's probably the time to take it before a lot of this stuff comes in. Our report uh, in that particular work, work stream is coming out in September. So we have the GFANS report coming out mid-June in two weeks time. And then we have his report coming out in September. And this chap here is the kind of point of contact, I guess we could say, for the exchanges, the stock markets and exchanges, not quite globally, but not far off. We would also like to see a uh, required disclosure of climate transition plans, again, across economies on a global basis. But who, I mean, how could they even enforce that? Why would governments go along with, with that? It just doesn't make any sense why they would all go along with this, with an organization that is not it has no elected officials. They are just a self-appointed forum of individuals. And yet they're going to be dictating to governments who are supposed to be elected by the people for the people. So it just raises this question, what the hell is going on right now with all of this stuff? So uh, in Canada, uh, the carbon price is legislated to $170 a ton in 2030. It is now going to be backed up by something called a contract carbon contract for differences. So talking about Canada here, which ladies and gents, I know a lot of you are in Canada who are subscribers. I would not want to be in Canada at the moment with all of the things that have been going on there. Not, not good at all. But actually Canada looks to be the test case for this sort of, I guess it's like a carbon credit based system where they're doing this whole sort of charging based on the amount of uh, carbon that you produce. Um, and uh, that's, that's what's decisive for investment. In uh, the UK and Europe, uh, the end of internal combustion engine vehicle sales in 2035, 2030 in some countries, that's decisive for the auto industry and investment in auto. Again, so we know 2035 pretty much. Uh, for those of you who love your normal cars, combustion cars, or you know you like to race cars, or, or you just like the feel of driving a car for yourself, well, you're gonna have to do that with electric vehicles by the year 2035. Now, look, I don't have an issue with electric vehicles. I know some people think I don't like electric vehicles. It's not that at all. It, my point with electric vehicles is that everyone keeps talking about them. 
as if these are greener than normal, you know, combustion engine cars. But it's not always the case. If you actually do the research and you find out where a lot of that electricity generation comes from to charge your vehicle, it's coming from coal and other power plants that these uh, use these sort of fuels. A lot of it isn't coming from solar panels and wind turbines and all this sort of stuff. So that's why I'm, I'm often quite harsh on electric cars. Not to talk e even about the batteries, you know, and all the rare earth minerals and metals that are needed to actually create these batteries. It is very, very damaging for the environment. And the batteries don't even last that long anyway. So do I think everyone should be getting an electric car? No, not necessarily, because you haven't yet solved the problem of having all of this renewable energy. So all you're doing is you're just making the problem worse. You're making the, the demand and drain on your natural gas and oil and coal and all these other sort of energy inputs even greater. Very clear commitments that are anchored probably around 2030 or thereabouts help to focus the mind for the types of investments that are necessary. Again, we keep going back to the same year, 2030. It's all about the year 2030. I am not looking forward, let me tell you, to the year 2030. I'm hoping that's the sort of, you know, the peak and everything will be okay at that point. But 2025, for those of you who've been following along, that is the year. That is the year that's supposed to be the worst year. Between 2023 and 2025, these are the years that are supposed to be the worst. So yes, we have a duty to create financial returns for our clients. That's why they hire us. So I've talked about this a lot and she's going to give a comment in a moment here. But I keep asking this question. Why would all of these banks and financial institutions want to move towards a green energy and a carbon net zero initiative? Why would they want to do that? I mean, nobody wants to see their long run financial returns sacrificed on the, or, uh, you know, on the altar of some principles. So now that still doesn't make complete sense to me. I personally don't, I think there's more to it than what they're saying. I think someone at the top here is putting pressure on these financial institutions and they are putting pressure on the institutions below them, as they've already said they are doing. But again, why would these financial institutions in the first place care about carbon emissions. I just don't think they would. There's something else going on here. There's something a lot deeper going on. And yes, there are a lot of people in the bank working on this because there's a massive value creation and destruction happening in the economy because of it. I've got to play you these clips so you can hear it for yourself. She has just admitted there is value creation, but also destruction occurring in the economy because of these measures. Every major, every global systemic bank, uh, with the exception of two in, in China, is part of GFANS. Every major bank, except two in China, is part of GFANS. Therefore, any leverage for a transaction that goes into, the, into these dark shadows. What? Dark shadows? What's he talking about there? Dark shadows? Drop a comment below. What's he talking about, dark shadows? Uh, have been emphatic on this point that if we are putting these rules in place, we have to uh, put them in place on a global basis. Again, back to this whole global basis. They want to create this one world thing for, for carbon like they have with the WTO, the WHO, IMF and, and all this other stuff. They want to create it now for carbon. And um, this is what I what I have learned from this is there's actually been vastly more progress in this area, broadly defined, than most people could have imagined a few years ago. Yeah, I think we can all agree with that. I don't know if progress would be the right word. I guess it depends how you look at all of this. I don't look at this in a positive way. What I see is people on that stage who are very wealthy, they are, they are elitists. Let's just be honest, they're very wealthy. Uh, same with the, the people in that room there. They are not affected, nor their families or friends, by any of this that's going on. And I'll use her words, the destruction in the economy as a result of these policies, right? It doesn't affect them, but it does affect you. Uh, sat there, wherever you are right now watching this video, it does affect 
you. And that's who I care about. I, I couldn't care less about these people. But I see on a day-to-day -day basis the destruction that this is doing to people through all of this inflation, through you know, all, all the problems with uh, heating and transportation now with fuel costs and uh, food prices. Uh, and this is, I'm sure, due in significant part to the efforts of all of you. Just this massive destruction of the middle class and the poor getting poorer by the day, it's, it's really, really sad to see. We'll feel encouraged that progress is being made and remain fully aware that it doesn't begin yet to be enough. You've just heard it right there. It doesn't begin yet to be enough. So I think we can probably expect to see a lot more of this coming down the line. Ladies and gents, thank you for tuning in today. Really appreciate you as a subscriber. I know that wasn't a, a positive video. It's somewhat worrying but at least we can take some comfort in knowing these plans, the transition plans, before they actually happen. I'll continue to make my forecast and update you whenever I see any of these papers, um, any of these new policies coming out, because I'm able to then look at them and see how will that affect things as we go into the future. All right, thanks for watching today. Take care, God bless, and I'll see you tomorrow.